Welcome to Plenary Session. I'm your host, Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a practicing hematologist oncologist and I'm associate professor of medicine. I'm interested in issues at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and that's what you're going to get on this podcast. Welcome to season two. Today, you're in for a special treat. This is a bonus episode. This is a lecture I gave to the meta researchers of metrics. It's entitled Cancer Meta Research 101, and it's geared at a broad and wide audience, and you won't want to miss this. And this lecture is a bonus episode, and slides are available to Patreon backers. So if you like this podcast, if you like Plenary Session, and you don't support us on Patreon.com, you should rethink that decision. On that positive note, we'll turn to the lecture, Cancer Meta Research 101, for a broad audience. So, hope you enjoy. So what I want to talk to you about today, um, there's this thing in oncology that if you spend a lot of time studying cancer drugs, you're going to hear a lot, and it's called progression-free survival. And I want to explain to you what that is, what that means, um, and is it something that's meaningful to patients, or is it something that's simply measurable, that's really easy to ascertain? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about crossover which is a unique phenomenon that's, that's present more in cancer clinical trials. There's some examples of crossover in the psychiatry literature. But in cancer, it's a unique beast. It's, it's, it's a certain type of crossover. And I wonder if it has led us to underestimate uh, good drugs, or has it perhaps the opposite actually led us to misestimate bad drugs and think of them as good? And then I'll show you some sort of broad um, empirical work that looks at the lay of the land of all of cancer drug space. So, you know, since it's a broad audience, I always think it's sometimes helpful to think about this from the point of view of a clinician. And um, I still spend a sizable amount of my time uh, on a weekly basis, um, you know, providing clinical care. Um, So this is actually um, a a loosely fictionalized story, but has a lot of truth to it. This is Mr. Jones. Um, Mr. Jones was a 75-year-old gentleman uh, who came to his primary care doctor, and he said that, you know, I have some belly pain. It comes and goes. And I've also, even though I haven't tried to, I've lost about five to 10 pounds. And so that's what he told the doctor. And, you know, what do you think the doctor did? Um, You know, you get an older gentleman, they're telling you they're losing a little bit weight, they're not trying to lose weight, um, and they're having a little bit of belly pain. I think the doctor did what 99 out of 100 doctors in America would do um, in about 30 seconds of thinking about it, which is he put them in a CAT scanner. Just go ahead and scan that person. We don't want to miss anything in this country. And in fact, um, we didn't miss anything with this patient because uh, on the CAT scan image, so this is, of course, if you look up from someone's feet um, and you have a slice of somebody, uh, this is what it looks like. And over here on the right, you can see the liver. This is the spleen. um, This is the bowel with some gas in it and some contrast because the patient drank some contrast. This is the spine. Um, And uh, you can see that there's something about the liver that looks a little patchy. It doesn't quite look quite look right. And these are the things that I'd point to. I'd point to this, uh, I forgot to mention, this is the pancreas, of course. Uh, The pancreas, the head of the pancreas looks actually a little bit enlarged. It's plump. Um, And there's a couple of lesions in the liver uh, that look abnormal. And we stick a needle in this. So this is the the miracle of medicine, is that maybe, um, you know, 30 years ago, it'd be difficult to get some of the tissue here. But now with the, the miracle of interventional radiology, you can put a needle in that really quickly, and you can send it to pathology. And um, within a day or two, we know that this gentleman has well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is a rather rare uh, type of pancreas cancer. My understanding, it's the type of pancreas cancer that Steve Jobs had, um, and it's not the common pancreatic adenocarcinoma that we think about um, as being such a dire prognosis. This is typically a often slower-growing um, cancer. It can secrete hormones, um, but that's what this gentleman had. Um, his case was non-functioning. It means it doesn't secrete hormones. And the year was 2010. And so, like any doctor in 2010, we did what uh, I would say 99 out of 100 doctors would do, which is we immediately opened the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines, which is a very long, you know, 1,000-page PDF file that tells you how to practice oncology, um, even if you have very little knowledge of oncology. It's meant to be user-friendly, and it's written by people who are wearing two hats. One, they 
are expert oncologists at academic medical centers and they write these guidelines. And the other hat is they have heavy industry relationships and consult for the industry. And so those are the two hats they wear. Um, and these guidelines, interestingly, by law, by a 1992 law, um, demands that Medicare pay for these drugs, any drug recommended at a certain level of evidence in the guideline. And Medicare has to pay for it and it can't negotiate the price of the drug. So these guidelines are really important for reimbursement um, and they're important for clinical practice. Practice. And so, you know, you go to these guidelines and boy, it's a rare tumor, but there's neuroendocrine guidelines. You look down, he's got local, regional or unresectable disease. That's my patient. It's asymptomatic. You know, even though he's got this belly pain, the more you talk to him about it, um, the belly pain actually got better after a month or two. Um, maybe it was related to something he had been eating. Uh, he had had more gas that month. Um, and they say, you know, actually for this kind of patient, you can just observe them um, and observe them with markers and scans and, and only think about uh, something different if they have clinically significant progressive disease, which we're going to explain. So that's what we do. We put this gentleman in a CAT scanner and then we say, you know what, come back four months later and we CAT scan him and you say, yeah, I don't know, is it a little bit bigger? Is it a little bit smaller? It's hard to know. Um, oh, it's looking bigger and we scan him again, we scan him again, scan him again, and it's, it's not changing a whole lot. And we and and you know a year later there he is coming to clinic he's gotten you know four CAT scans so he's gotten a proper dose of radiation um, but not a therapeutic dose but he's gotten some radiation um, and 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 he tells me um, there's good news there's something that just got published the oncology drug advisory committee meeting which is a, a panel of the U S Food and Drug Administration they've approved a new drug for this exact thing that I have and it's called Everlimus and it's approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and the vote I mean this is a 10-0 vote everyone thought that this was a terrific drug and so there's a new option for me so you know let's look into that doc and I said yeah absolutely turns out it's paired with the New England Journal of Medicine publication and it turns out uh, that the primary endpoint is progression-free survival. And progression-free survival looks like it is improved with this drug. The median is 11 months, whereas the median on placebo is four and a half months. The Kaplan-Meier survival curve looks like this. And the hazard ratio is 0.35, which is something oncologists really like to see. They don't know exactly what it means, but they know a lower number is better. And they like low hazard ratios. And, and this is a low number by our standards. Now, you might ask, why? Does this graph have this stair step characteristic to it? Why are the events more likely to happen in certain periods of time? And when I explain to you what progression free survival is, which I will in a couple slides, it's going to make perfect sense to you why that has this stair step feature. But also in this publication, interestingly, the authors had measured overall survival or how long people live. And it turns out that there didn't look like this drug did anything at all. And here there's, of course, no stair step. This is a time to event endpoint that's measured continuously. And hazard ratio is one. And it looks as, you know, like it's not doing anything as anything can be. So this is what we know about the drug. And of course, 10-0 this is worth, worth considering, says the ODAC. And you know what? So after we learn about this drug, um, he says, you know, let's get, scan me one more time. I just want to be sure. And we scan him one more time. And, you know, if I wouldn't, you know, the, the lighting, the, you know, doesn't come out as nicely on the slide, but the, it actually looks like maybe the tumor's gotten a little bit bigger on, uh, on the actual imaging. So it turns out this guy now has maybe potentially clinically significant progressive disease. It's getting a little bit bigger. And now the NCCN guidelines, 2012, they've updated. They've, they're quick. They're really quick to update when something new's out there. And they say you can give him Everlimus 10 milligrams a day. And so he's interested. He's asking me, should I consider this new drug? And that's what he, that's what he asks me. Well, I tell him that, you know what, at, whenever I think about it, any drug, I think, one, does it improve your, your duration of life, how long you're going to live? And I'm going to say, when it comes to overall survival, we have no credible evidence this drug will extend your life. In fact, if you actually look at death rates in the trial, 12 people in, 12 people in the Everlimus group are 6%, and only 4 people on placebo died while receiving the study drug. So those were treatment-related or deaths thought attributable to the study medication. That looked like there was an excess, if anything. Um, and there's no clear overall survival advantage from this drug. In terms of quality of life, of course, the investigators haven't released that data. Perhaps they haven't even collected that data. But what we do know is that stomatitis or um, um, dry um, and painful sores in the mouth, that's increased um, sizably with this drug. A rash is a common feature of this drug. Diarrhea is a common feature of this drug. And fatigue, which is often a debilitating fatigue, um, is more likely with this drug than placebo. And of course, the placebo rates are high because you know these are people with cancer who are often elderly. 
But progression-free survival is better. And Mr. Jones is savvy, and he asked me, and this is actually very semi-fictionalized, very loosely fictionalized. He really asked me, what is progression-free survival? And so I explained. This is the single most common endpoint in phase three clinical trials of cancer drugs, and this is what it is. If we measured your tumors at baseline, like I showed you on the scan, we can come up with certain indices of the tumor, the diameter of the tumor. Uh, we could multiply the diameter. We could get some assessment of the volume using, you know, classic geometry. Um, Progression-free survival is the time until one of four things happen. One, the patient could die. You start them on a drug and two months later they die. Um, that's a progression-free survival endpoint. It's checking off the box. It's composite time to event endpoint. The next thing that could happen is they have new lesions on the scan. So I put the patient in and there wasn't something in the lung. Now there is a spot in the lung. I can needle biopsy it. That's pancreas cancer. That's progression. It didn't exist before. It does exist now. And you can imagine as CAT scans get more and more um, clear and, and finer, and as the ability to put a needle in places gets higher, this endpoint is shifting over time. It's getting more sensitive. And of course, progression-free survival, what the bulk of it means is the change in the tumors you've decided to measure. So we always pick about three to five tumors to measure. And if the diameter increases 120%, that's considered progressive disease. If the tumor initially shrinks, and if it shrinks more than 30%, by the way, it's called a response, uh, 29%, I'm sorry, that's called stable disease, but 31%, that's a response. If it shrinks, you can have a response, but then 20% is from the smallest it ever was. So it's from the nadir value. So progression-free survival is the time until one of four things happen. Patient dies, new lesions, they have straight progression, or they have a response and then progression. Okay, so you can actually progress with less tumor than initially if you had a response in the meantime. So this is it. It's a composite primary endpoint. I tell the patient, it's something we can measure. It depends on the frequency of scans. So we have some research that we're looking at, some meta research, where it turns out that, you know, um, it can be artifactually adjusted by how often you scan somebody. And if you really want to find differences, you can scan somebody every day and you can find, you know, almost trivial but statistically significant differences. Different people measure it differently. So I didn't show you too much of this literature, but if you take the same scans and give it to 10 people, they will measure it differently. Some people will call a response. Some people won't. There are even crazy situations where some people will think it grew and some people will think it stayed the same or shrunk, um, which baffles you, but that is the, the measurement error. And the reason I think is that, you know, measuring a tumor on a CAT scan, it's not like measuring your height. It's like measuring the width of a cloud between your fingers. There's some fuzziness and grayness and there's ambiguity in what you think the, where it begins and ends. Um, it's, it's certainly not a measure of how a patient feels or functions. I'll show you some data on that. And it is a composite time to event endpoint. Just like the cardiology trials, uh, it, four things go into it. But I think people forget that. That's the case. So the patient says to me, you're saying a response is 30% tumor shrinkage. Every day I read the newspaper and they say, there's a new drug out there. People are responding. People aren't responding. Um, you know, you say that it's 30% tumor shrinkage. That sounds arbitrary to me. Why is it 30? Why not 40? Why not 25? Can you tell me where these numbers come from? I say, you know what? I'll be happy to, actually, because I'm writing a book called Malignant, so I had to read, about, I had to read a lot about where this came from, but I'll be happy to tell you about it, you know, writing a book, uh, so it's, it's right on the top of my, top of my uh, mind. So it turns out this guy, Charles Mortel in Mayo Clinic in 1976, he got 16 of his best friend oncologists to get together, and one senior investigator at the NCI told me that this was actually at a dinner party, but I've never been able to prove that in the literature. And what he did was he got 12 marbles that were different sizes from like eight centimeters to half a centimeter, and he put them on a table, and he rolled out two sheets of foam rubber, a thin foam rubber to simulate, um, uh, you know, the parts of the body you can feel, and, 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 a, and a thicker foam rubber to simulate the abdomen. Okay. 12 solid spheres, 1.8 to, oh, sorry, I'm the bigger than I thought, 1.8 to 14 centimeters. The foam rubber was either half an inch thick to approximate the skin and subcutaneous tissue and 1.5 inches thick to approximate the abdominal wall. Um, so I think, and this is 1976, so you have to think about the average BMI at the time. And then every doctor invited brought the the ruler or caliper that he employed in clinical practice. So of course it's all men, and the only way they can actually assess the tumors is by caliper feeling through the skin. So that's what he's doing. And he actually had a little trick that tumors five and six were the same size and tumors seven and eight were also the same size. 
And so he did all these sorts of measurements. And basically his question was, how often did two different investigators think the same tumor was actually different? And that changes depending on whether or not you use a 25% cutoff or a 50% cutoff. And then how often did the same investigator think the same tumor was actually different? And that also depends on the cutoffs you use because, of course, with smaller cutoffs, you are much more prone to making measurement errors. And with larger cutoffs, I think we can reasonably agree this is bigger than that. And it turns out that that's where the cutoffs come from, that these cutoffs, which were what, 16 men feeling with calipers through foam rubber in 1976 could operationally dissertain, could separate by measurement, those were chosen as, as response markers, not because they signified efficacy, but for operational reasons, that in an era before CAT scans, this is the best you can do. And, 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 and to this day, we have not improved upon it. Okay, so Mr. Jones is savvy. He said, but wait a second, Doc, you said 50%, but now you're saying 30%. That's a change. So something has changed. And actually, yeah, there was a change. So WHO used 50%, which is a bi-dimensional measurement. So you measure it in two dimensions, which roughly has a volumetric measurement of 34%. And then in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it switched to a single measurement, which they thought would be more simple. Um, and, and here they use 30% because in one dimension, it roughly approximates the same sort of volumetric difference. So that's been the major advance is that you measure one dimension, not two. So I think Mr. Jones says, you know, it's no wonder progression-free survival doesn't capture how I feel. And now, of course, we know through, um, you know, a recent JAMA internal medicine study by Kovax and colleagues that um, drugs that improve progression-free survival do not improve commensurately health-related quality of life. That's a nice paper from about a year ago. And there's another group um, led by Aaron Kesselheim and Bishal Gaywali that um, found a similar finding in the International Journal of Cancer that we know progression-free survival doesn't correlate with health-related quality of life. And that's likely because the cutoffs are arbitrary. Um, there's no reason why you suddenly feel bad at 31% and you suddenly feel and you're okay at 29%. Patients can deteriorate at 10% or 5%, they can feel a lot worse. And some people actually feel fine even to a 68%, 80% tumor growth. You know, so it's really quite uh, disconnected. Um, but surely drugs that improve progression free survival extend lives. So that's the question. So, you know, we've done, I think, several sort of meta research papers on this topic. Uh, this was one that came out in 2015, um, where we look in the oncology literature at every single um, tumor setting and every single trial level meta-analysis. These are analyses where, well, I'll tell you what they do. Okay, so what is a trial level meta-analysis? So let's say you wanna validate any surrogate endpoint. You wanna know, is progression-free survival a predictor of overall survival? Well, the wrong way to do that, to validate it as a surrogate endpoint for regulatory approval and decision-making, the wrong way is to just take 200 patients and ask, do people who have longer PFS live longer? And the answer is, yeah, probably they do. Um, but that's just validating it as a prognostic marker. To validate it as a surrogate marker, you have to ask, in randomized control trials, do drugs that improve progression-free survival compared to the control arm, do they later improve overall survival compared to the control arm? And one simple way to do it is you do a meta-analysis. So let's say in a tumor type, hypothetically, breast cancer, we, we do a survey of the literature and there's two trials. One where PFS in the experimental arm was six months and three months in the control, OS was shown here, and the other trial looked like this. You plot on one axis the change in overall survival and on the other axis, the change in progression-free survival. And each trial is one data point. And we have this for many, many clinical situations. Um, we have, uh, you know, hundreds of studies in this, in these scatter plots. And then you perform linear regression. And the correlation coefficients, a measure of how well the points fit the line, is really telling you something useful. It's telling you what percent of the variability in overall survival is explained by the variability in progression-free survival. That's what the R squared, R coefficient of determination is telling you. And the German ICWIG has provided these cutoffs for what they think a reliable, medium, or weak correlation is. So this comes from ICWIG, and, and this is the simple approach. Whatever situation, you're talking about breast cancer and drugs, pancreas cancer, um, I think we can't talk about pancreas neuroendocrine tumor because I believe no one has ever actually done that, but whatever you know, colon cancer we can talk about, lung cancer we can talk about. And so we did this, and we did sort of an umbrella um, analysis where we looked in every published study that used this approach ever done, and we noted a few things. So this is just like the first of a four-page figure. One thing we noticed, this is a timeline, um, 2000 to 2020, 
Um, this is each triangle is a surrogate validation study. The color of the triangle is the strength of the correlation as graded by ICWIG. Um, the size of the triangle is the number of randomized control trials that is included. So what's notable, I think, is that um, from 2000 to 2005, there was very little interest in this. From 2010 to 2015 and 2015 to 2020, I can't even show you how long this page goes, but there's a lot of interest in this. We're a lot more interested in validating surrogates than we ever were. And that's probably because of shifting regulatory standards. I also want to point out that there's a lot of red on this plot. There are a lot of surrogates like cult, like breast cancer. Does progression-free survival predict overall survival? And the answer is not so good, not so good, not so good. Um, uh, there is some green. Um, there are some really good examples. What's this one? This is this is lymphoma metastatic. I'm pretty sure this is probably in diffuse large B cell lymphoma if three-year progression-free survival predicts overall survival. And the reason it's probably so strong is because it's a curative setting. And so if you really are free of disease a few years later, you're probably likely to live longer. That's why I think that that's one there. Um, but there are a lot of, lot of these studies. And some of them, they're doing regression analyses on four points. I'm not an expert, but if you start to do a regression analysis on just two points, I think I'm going to have a pro I think two points I have a problem with. Um, but four points is not so terrific. So this is the lay of the land of these entire studies. This is an updated uh, paper we did. Um, this is every single study we could ever find. Um, and we did like a multi-methods thing. And basically we grouped them in certain cancer settings. I, I won't con confuse you too much with that. Let's just talk about metastatic setting like my patient I told you about. Somebody who you can't cure with surgery. It turns out the majority of these correlations are poor. Um, uh, some are medium. And strong correlations are few and far between. Uh, I should have, for your audience, I should have added a slide. But we also look to see, you know, every time they do one of these analyses, um, they have the luxury of either looking at just the published literature or the published and unpublished literature. Um, and sometimes they have a published study where they don't get all the data points. So, for instance, the authors may not have reported, um, you know, overall survival, and that might never be reported. And we looked through these studies and we asked, you know, how many of these studies used a convenience sample? How many used a systematic sample? And how many were able to get all the data? And we find that the absolute best studies were only able to get about 50% of the relevant data. 50% of the randomized trials, they were not able to include in these analyses. So these are all highly... Um, they're, they're just dependent on sort of the tip of the iceberg of data that's available. There's a huge amount of data that's not included here. And I suspect if you included that data, it's not going to make the correlations look better. Those are the studies that there is some discordance between these endpoints, and that's probably why people aren't talking about them so much. I suspect the correlations will just deteriorate if you actually were able to get a fully transparent view of the literature. So, you know, it might be okay, I think, I think it might be okay to approve drugs based on surrogates like progression-free survival, even if they don't improve survival, even if they don't correlate with health-related quality of life. If we agree, this is cancer, it's a dire condition, maybe four years or five years on the U.S. market, we're going to do a follow-up study to test whether or not survival is improved. I mean, if we, if we agreed to that, I think I'm willing to compromise. So we have analyzed that, and others have too, in a number of papers, and this is an analysis of 50 drugs um, that were approved by the FDA solely on the basis of a surrogate endpoint. And we followed them out in time. This is a JAM Internal Medicine paper. We followed them out in time five years into the future. And we did a literature search on every one of these 50 drugs. And we asked, you know, when you approved the drug, you didn't know I lived longer. With five years on the U.S. market, how many of them have now proven they improve survival in any, you know, in any trial in that disease setting? And the answer was roughly, here's a total, I'm sorry, it's not 54, it's 36. I'm getting a couple papers confused in my mind. It was 36 uh, approvals that we tracked. Yeah, 50 would have been too much work for us. Uh, it's about 15% improved overall survival later. Um, many of them, 50%, had no overall survival benefit despite the fact a randomized trial was conducted, typically with overall survival as a secondary endpoint. It failed to show the benefit. And then for about a third of these drugs, there was overall survival benefit was never revisited. We just never learned anything about this drug. Um, you have to keep this in mind that currently, this year, the FDA will approve 67%, two-thirds of cancer drugs based on a surrogate endpoint, and I think this was replicated by the EMA uh, in a paper in the British Medical Journal um, by Courtney Davis, um, that even about five years on the market, we're only going to know if they improve survival for a paucity of these drugs. 
And uh, other groups have replicated this for, for health-related quality of life, and the results are sort of very comparably dismal, that even with many years on the market, the, only a minority improve health-related quality of life. So, you know, progression-free survival generally does not predict overall survival, I tell Mr. Jones. And, you know, for your particular tumor, we have no credible data that it's a stronger correlation. We just don't know anything because there just haven't been enough randomized trials in pancreas, in peanut pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, to even do one of these studies. So what does Mr. Jones decide to do? What does he decide to do? There's no survival benefit. I'll take a guess from the audience. There's no survival benefit. We only improved this marker that was that was based on totally arbitrary cut points. Um, there's stomatitis. There's diarrhea. Um, it's also I didn't tell you the cost, but the cost is like you know seven eight thousand dollars a month at least the year it was approved. Of course, it's been ratcheted up higher since. But so it costs a ton of money. There's no survival benefit. There's all this uncertainty. There's an increased risk of death while on treatment. He he decides to do, I think, the only thing, the only thing anyone ever decides to do, which is let's give it a try. It doesn't hurt to try. It never hurts to try. You just try it, and if you, if things don't go well, you don't you can stop it. But if you don't try, you don't even know. And and that's that's American oncology. I mean, I've been in um, so many places, and I would say that there, I, I just there's no other sort of attitude that people will come. I mean, very few people will say it's not worth trying, but most people say, let's try. I'm willing to take all that uncertainty. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that in the questions maybe. Um, so we give it a try. And one month later, he comes back to me. And this is really, this is the most true part of the story, which is he says, I feel, he uses a word I'm not familiar with. And then he says worse. So I feel really bad because so many of these drugs, you know, of course are tested on people 10 years younger than average cancer patients. There's a lot of meta research that I should have shown you that shows that um, their side effect profile is not terrific. And you start to extrapolate to older, frailer people and you get really intolerable side effects and this drug is taken daily continuously um and it it has a lot of it has a lot of debilitating side effects and people really discontinue a fair bit so a couple years later um mr jones was reading the newspaper um, or some periodical and he comes to tell me that i have made a blunder here's my blunder so do you remember years ago when Radian 3 came out, that Everlimus study, you were a skeptic. You told me that PFS doesn't predict OS and, you know, that uh, it doesn't improve health-related quality of life. Well, you know what? People like you are the problem because I just saw this ad. This is the advert. It says, it says the final overall survival results of that randomized trial are out. And guess what? There's that OS benefit. You see it right there. It's color-coded, so you can't miss it. 6.3-month survival benefit. And... I guess some people might view this as a small difference between Kaplan-Meier curves, but there's an old saying in medical oncology, which is, if you can fit a laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary at the national meeting. And in fact, you can fit two laser pointers, I think, easily between these two curves, and you could give the plenary. So he says I was wrong. So I really was baffled because, you know, this trial has a lot of problems for me. And so um, I was really shocked that this drug could improve survival. And so I, I did some digging. So one thing is, you know, I was like, well, he's right, you know. And what, I was like, what is this like right here? Clinically meaningful improvement in overall survival. I was like, well, who are they to tell me what's meaningful? I'll tell them what's meaningful. Okay. And then I was like, well, what's all this? Oh, this stuff on the fine print. Let me blow that up. What's that say? Oh, not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. That's what it says in the fine print. Not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. That's, that's a new one to me. I, I've seen so often the other situation, but I wasn't familiar with this, that it's not significant, but it's, it's really meaningful. Um, of course, but the authors say this is due to crossover. And this is, I think, the next portion of the talk. Okay, crossover. So why do they say that? What they're saying here is this difference, it would have been larger but we did something that we don't know that we did something that's probably um, uh, that's unusual in medicine, but not unusual in cancer medicine, which is all of the people on this placebo arm, when their tumors got worse, we allowed them to take Everlimus. We let them take Everlimus. And since we let these people, not all of them, but some fraction of them, take Everlimus, they had unidirectional crossover. They crossed over from the control arm in one direction to the experimental arm. Of course, the experimental arm does not cross over to placebo. They continue on to subsequent lines of therapy, which we have chemotherapy and some other things we use here. So they've inserted unidirectional crossover, and they say, you know, if we hadn't done that, this would have been bigger and statistically significant. So that's what they say. So let's talk about this. 
What is unidirectional crossover? We take patients with cancer, we randomize them drug or placebo, and when patients progress, these people move to this. Okay, so does this make sense? So it's unidirectional. Only one direction moves to the other. We don't have a movement this way. It's different than, um, it's different than um, I think, psychiatry trials that often use crossover, but they, um, you know, you take an SSRI for six weeks and then you don't take it for a washout period, then you take it again, and you can compare the same user uh, to themselves while on drug, off drug. Here, the endpoint is like progression or death. Really, death is the final endpoint. Um, so there's no sort of uh, intra-user comparisons. Uh, it's really sort of baked into the trial design. And this is incredibly common. In fact, we just published a paper on Monday in JAMA Internal Medicine where we, we'll, we talked about this at length. Um, we looked at the entire literature on this. Okay, so really what happens is you take patients with cancer. If they take the experimental drug, when they progress, they get the standard of care. And if they take the placebo, when they progress, they get the experimental drug. That's what they're doing. So I think that there are situations in medicine where crossover is desirable. You want to have it. You ought to have it. And if you don't have it, it's an unethical trial. And I think there's situations in cancer that crossover is undesirable. You don't want it. It's a confounding event. If you insert it, you're perverting your trial and makes it inference unreliable. And then I think trials have crossover. And then I think trials don't have crossover. And we get these combinations. If crossover is good to have and you have it, that's good. And if you shouldn't have it and you don't, that's also good. But we also have these examples where you, you shouldn't have it and you do, and you don't have it and it is desirable. So you see, so I'm going to take you through some of these four examples. I think this is conceptually how I think about it. So Everlimus has crossover. That's what they're telling me. But was crossover desirable in that trial or was it undesirable? i give you an example that will make it super clear. Um, this is Cipolucil T. It is a cancer therapeutic vaccine. Um, what is a cancer therapeutic vaccine? So you all know about vaccines, and you may even know about a cancer vaccine. People may tell you that the HPV vaccine is a cancer vaccine. Um, cancer, in that sense, cancer vaccine, the HPV vaccine is supposed to prevent you from acquiring HPV, which will lead to cancer. A cancer therapeutic vaccine is when you take somebody who already has metastatic cancer spread, um, and you give them a vaccine that will rev up their immune system to fight the cancer. Um, that's a cancer therapeutic vaccine. And it is a phenomenally interest. Uh, you know, there's so much interest in this um, class of medications for 40 years. There has been a single drug that's ever been FDA approved that's a cancer therapy vaccine. It's Cipolucil T, and I'm going to show you the data that led to the approval. Every single other one has failed. Every other one. I mean, talking hundreds of hundreds of cancer therapeutic vaccines have failed. It's astonishing. It is the most failed class of, of medicine, I think. And yet they continue to get NIH funding, which is another story. But this is the success. And here's why it's successful. If you give this vaccine to people with prostate cancer, this is overall survival. It's improved against placebo. Clear as day. But there's something fishy about this trial. It's the only one ever to be approved. There was no response. Not a single person in that study that got that vaccine had that tumor shrink 30% or more. Zero out of hundreds. And there was no change in the time to progression. The progression-free survival was the same. It didn't, it didn't delay the growth of the tumor. And yet it still had a four-month survival gain. How does a drug that doesn't shrink tumor, it doesn't delay tumor growth, make you live longer? I mean, in cancer medicine, all of the effective drugs, they, I mean, many of the effective drugs, they have a lot of response and, 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 they, and they usually delay PFS. Um, this doesn't do any of that. It has no activity. So it turns out it's very interesting trial design. They take patients with the prostate cancer, they randomize them to this or this. And if you get placebo, you get this, you get this frozen salvage vaccine. They have crossover. And if you get Cipolucil T, you get docetaxel. Docetaxel has randomized control trial evidence saying the administration of docetaxel improves overall survival. And here you get docetaxel only after you progress a second time. Your tumor gets another 20% bigger. And so it turns out that I'll, I, that's so hard to read. I'll just show you on the plot. 57% of people get docetaxel in this arm, and only 50% get it here. Here they get it at 12 months, and here they get it at 14 plus months. So this trial is not just a randomized trial of Cipolucil T or placebo. It's a randomized trial of something and then docetaxel, or something and then something else, and then docetaxel. If you removed Cipolucil T and replaced it with drinking a cup of coffee, I think you would get the exact same result of the clinical trial. That this group, you waste their time once, and they drink coffee, and then they get a proven life-saving drug. And this group, you make them drink um, decaf 
Of course, that's the placebo. And then you make them drink a cup of coffee, and only again when their tumor grows again, you give them the drug, right? So, I mean, you can have a drug that has no benefit to patients and still spuriously see a benefit. Um, okay, I showed you that. So, in fact, the AHRQ commissioned a report on this drug, and this is from their report, quote, we cannot conclude the fact that survival in the absence of response rate or PFS is actually due to harm towards the control group from delay in chemotherapy due to getting an ineffective frozen salvage product. So that's their conclusion. So let's come back to this chart. Um, I think on this chart, I think what we've realized is that Everlimus, it really was a situation like Cipolucil T. Crossover was undesirable. Because if you progress on Everlimus, you're going to get streptozosin, you're going to get cisatoposide, the drugs we use for peanut that have proven um, benefit, well, with an asterisk, but that we've used for a long time that have remarkable activity. If you get um, placebo in that radiant trial, then you get Everlimus, and only then do you get the therapies we like to use. So I like to think crossover is undesirable in trials assessing the fundamental efficacy of a cancer drug. And, simple, and that Everlimus trial had crossover, and Cipolucil T had crossover, and that's bad. Okay, now let me just give you one example on the other side to make to kind of just help your, I don't know, conceptual thinking. There are also situations in cancer where crossover is desirable, and we don't have it. And that's, that's probably, in fact, in fact, not just probably, it is a bigger problem in our paper this week. So this is an example. This is a drug that um, called abiraterone, and it works in prostate cancer for people who have very advanced prostate cancer. And the first clinical trial randomized people to abiraterone or placebo after having received docetaxel, so in the latter line of therapy, and there's a survival advantage. And this trial wanted to give abiraterone early. They randomized people much earlier in their disease course to abiraterone or placebo, which is fine. But the question, of course, is the people on the placebo, when their tumors get worse, they should eventually get the standard of care, which is abiraterone. So do they? This is what the letter to the editor says. Um, okay. Before these trials were run that tried to move this drug up, and the reason moving a drug up is very important is the market share when you move a drug up is much, much bigger than the market share when you use it in the last line. You're getting so many more patients, and you're giving them the drug for longer, and you're going to make a lot more money. So cancer medicine is all about moving these drugs up. That's a huge um, motive in the field. And so these authors write, before these trials were run, the standard of care for patients with advanced prostate cancer was sequential suppression with various life-prolonging therapies like abiraterone. But the control arms of these trials were not designed to include the current sequential standard of care those crossover treatments, these treatments were not specified in the protocols. This is critical since the majority of men in the control arms in Stampede and Latitude died without exposure to abiraterone or enzalutamide. Thus, the drugs used in the control arms were inconsistent with the prevailing standard of care. This has implications for the conclusions and raises questions. So what these authors are saying is crossover is desirable when the treatment has already proven a benefit in a latter line of therapy, and you're trying to move it forward, you're trying to give it early into more people, you got to test giving it early versus giving it on the back end, which is what, which, what you should be doing in your clinic right now because it's proven benefit. And if you deprive the control arm of crossover in this situation, that's actually bad. That leads to a false inference about that the drug should be given early. Okay, so the reason I say all this is it turns out um, in the, and I should have put this slide because this paper just came out on Monday, and it's called um, Limitations in um, Clinical Trials Leading to FDA Approval. And it basically says that 67%, uh, two-thirds of trials that lead to drug approval have serious limitations. And here are the limitations. One, um, you, d you did crossover incorrectly. Roughly one in five, five trials, they either move a drug up and they don't give it to the control arm ever because they run in... Um, resource poor settings globally, like East, like parts of Eastern Europe or Africa or Asia. So the control arm essentially doesn't get the U.S. standard of care. Um, that's that's a chunk of this problem. Um, another chunk of the problem is the Cipolucil T or Everlimus problem, where they mandate a unidirectional crossover when they have no idea if the drug is beneficial, which could spuriously create a benefit when none exists. Um, we also find errors, classic errors are the control arm is beneath the U.S. standard of care. They use a surrogate endpoint. Survival is never improved on the back end. Um, and, oh, I'm, I'm, I forget myself, but there's a, four, there's a fourth limitation in that paper. 
I, 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 I'm the like, Talal should, uh, th that's a, that's a faux pas on my part. I'll, I'll have to think more. It's been a while since I looked at that paper, but there's a fourth limitation. And, and if you look at these limitations that really do, I think, undermine the credibility of random, a uh, credibility of, of, of evidence for these drugs, which are now routinely hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, the fact that two thirds of the drugs have these limitations, I think is untenable. Okay. So back to Mr. Jones, because I think, um, I think this is so telling. So his tumors grow after after observation. We give him platinum metoposide, and he has you know a, a super robust response. And then he asks me, you know, how come we never sequenced my cancer genome, doctor? I thought you were a good doctor, and if you were good, you should have sequenced that entire genome because that's what good doctors do. And I said, well, that's a, that's a good story. So now let me just close by telling you about the landscape of oncology. Um. You know, so we've spent a lot of time, more time than I wish, um, trying to just map something that should be really simple, which is if you could make a if you could make sort of a graph of every person in 2019 who will die of metastatic cancer, can you just tell me what are the kinds of therapies you give to these patients? Like who's getting what? How many people get genome targeted therapies? So those are the therapies that you read about all the time in the news, where we test a gene mutation, we find the mutation, we go to the we go to the the pharmacy and we find the the key that fits the lock, and we put the key in and we turn it and the, the cancer goes away. You know, those are the the great precision oncology stories. How many people? How many people benefit from this immunotherapy? This is what Jim Allison a couple years ago won the Nobel Prize for. These are the drugs that uh, unleash the immune system on your tumor. Um, you know, it's I was watching television the other day and it said, ask your doctor about immunotherapy. I said, I don't have metastatic non-squamous uh, stage four lung cancer. I, why would you think I had it in the middle of the Super Bowl? But, you know, those are the kinds of ads we're getting because that's a, it's a blockbuster class of medications. Um, and then what about those old drugs, those drugs that just kill cells that divide rapidly? How many people are eligible for those and these are boring drugs that if you if you watch the news or read paper articles you would think are just poison in fact they're called poison poison drugs that are awful and that no one should ever get so what are the numbers so let me talk about the poison drugs first so the way we've kind of done this is we we go to tables like American Cancer Society we get a list of like all the tumor types and then we go through guidelines and we go through FDA drug approvals and we ask what are the recommended therapies and we assume we live in a perfect world where everyone has really good performance status everyone is fit enough for therapy and everyone who would be potentially eligible for these therapies is um, it, we're deeming eligible for those therapies so if you look at those old cytotoxic drugs um, as of 2018. 80% of U.S. patients are eligible for one of those drugs, whether or not you have lymphoma, prostate cancer, um, lung cancer. Even to this day, the major I mean, I think oncologists would, would be wrong to think that there's anything else we're doing the most. This is the absolute number one thing we do. We give those old drugs. Um, and the percent of people whose tumors respond is roughly one in three of all U.S. cancer patients if we were to apply this very broadly. So this is what the cytotoxics look like. This is immunotherapy. We published this paper in JAMA um, Network Open, and this shows that actually this immunotherapy is better than I would have expected. About 43% of U.S. cancer patients are now eligible for immunotherapy, and the biggest drivers are lung cancer, which is, in fact, the biggest cause of cancer death, um, and also uh, ben and also somehow responds to immunotherapy. Um, and these are sort of the other contributors. But about half of people aren't eligible. And those genome drugs that everyone talks about, that we have funneled so much research agenda money into, they account for 8.3% of all U.S. cancer patients, in part because they're not in every tumor type, and when they are present, they're present at low frequencies. And so this is the lay of the land here. And so here I've actually plotted it. So this is, you'll find this interesting. So this is year by year, the percent of people eligible for genome-driven cancer drugs based on FDA approvals and the percent of people who might have that 30% or more tumor shrinkage year by year. And you can see that even though the cost of sequencing has fallen three log fold over this time, and even though people talk about we're reaching an inflection point, that we are accelerating the pace of innovation, that's the rhetoric that's used, it is a stone cold flat half a percent per year upward growth of these drugs. We are learning new targets at half a percent a year. And in fact, I want to update this. I got somebody working on the update. It's, uh, but I know the answer. It's going to be on the line. It's on the line. There's no revolution. 
Uh, and the cancers where these these druggable genes are really, I think, important are often rare tumors where a single fusion genomic event or single driver mutation event actually is responsible for the majority of the phenotype, where complex um, cancers of, 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 of aging, um, they are often driven by multifactorial processes and they're not a single driver event. And so it's, I think it, we will never have a revolution where these drugs improve outcomes for the majority of people. It's going to be on this curve until we all live our lives. Uh, it's never going to change. Um, and I think it has to do with biology, not has to do with any lack of funding. But you know, they, they promise otherwise for, for decades. The checkpoint inhibitors have been so interesting. It, prior to 2011, there there were no approvals for those those unleashing the immune system drugs. Um, 2011 was the first approval. In fact, in 2005, uh, they were almost at risk of not being funded. People thought it was so unpromising. Uh, it worked in melanoma. That's why they get a nice 1%. And then the lung cancer approval comes and boom, they get the big market share. And then they get all these other approvals and they're creeping up the market share. The, the orange line shows the percent of cancer patients who have response to these drugs, that tumor shrinkage. I just want to, I mean, you might view this as speculation, but I think this is what's going to happen. This line is plateauing. Only about 15% of cancers, I think, are truly um, due to impaired immune surveillance and will truly benefit from these drugs. This line, the eligible population, that's going to keep growing up and up and up because drug companies' incentive is to maximize the blue and not maximize the orange. They don't care about that. The blue is dollars in their pocket. So their inclusion criteria, their use of biomarker cutoffs, their entire sort of apparatus of clinical trials is trying to creep up this market share, and they don't really care if they're actually finding the right people. They want to run the largest possible trial with the smallest benefit so they can justify use in the broadest population. I mean, I think that's that's what we're going to see. The cytotoxics, I can't do it year by year, in fact, because it goes back to the 60s and it's just so complicated. So I've just shown you where cytotoxics are, the cumulative percent of people with tumor shrinkage and the cumulative use. And I guess I just want to point out that despite all the rhetoric, the landscape of oncology is the exact opposite of the rhetoric. It is the older, you know, toxic drugs. And and I say toxic kind of tongue in cheek because, you know, um, I, I guess I want to make this point. When you when you practice a lot of oncology, I think you will, and if you're really open-minded, you will conclude that some of these drugs are more toxic than these drugs. Why do I say that? This is a drug that I give to a patient every three weeks. And then for two days, the patient has maybe diarrhea or they feel unwell or they lose their hair. Then they have two good weeks where they feel good. They're not getting any drugs. They're out and about. They're living their lives. But they have, you know, every time they get their drug, they're going to spend the weekend at home on the couch watching Netflix. These drugs I give patients and it doesn't have as much diarrhea, but they take the drug every day of their life. And so they're having four times diarrhea every day of your life. There's no break. There's no good week. And a drug with less toxicity that's constant is actually often more intolerable than drug with more toxicity that's episodic. I just think it's, um, there's no empirical data that proves that. I suspect that that's the case, but it would be a good study to do, but I think it'd be hard to get funding for that. Um, so my conclusions here are the genome therapies sound great, but they still apply to few patients. I, for, I didn't mention to the, you. I didn't mention this point, but actually, there's so many new genome therapies, but the majority are just me too drugs hitting the same target. It's not that we're constantly finding new targets. New target acquisition is very few and far between. It's half a percent a year. But new drugs for old targets that have longer patents that cost more. That's that's every day. That's that's much more common. Cytotoxics sound outdated, but they benefit many. All right. So. The do so then finally thing that Mr. Jones said to me is he said, you know, I really appreciate all the time you spent answering my questions. You know, I, I, I as a doctor, I, the way I handle all this stuff is I just spend a lot of time telling people what I know. Um, and then I told him that, you know, that's not statistically significant, but, you know, that, that is actually clinically meaningful. Um, and, and that's the right way to use that phrase, not the way they used in their little advertisement. Um, okay. And then I guess since we have a few minutes, um, I'll just say this. How good are the drugs that come to market? This is really elegant analysis. I came out of Sweden a couple years ago, and they take a drug, imatinib, which was approved for CML. And, and here's what they're showing you. Here's the life expectancy of the general population for a 55-year-old female in the blue line. And the yellow line shows the life expectancy of patients with CML in a Swedish data set. And you can see this is the year you were diagnosed with cancer, okay? The year you were diagnosed, not the year you started treatment. 
And imatinib was approved about 2000, 2001 in Sweden. And the life expectancy gap, which was about 20 years, closed really dramatically. And the reason it started to go up in the years prior to imatinib is that, you know, 50% of the people diagnosed in 1996 were alive in 2000, and then they started taking the drug, and their survival was improved. So it actually kind of goes retroactively and improved. So that's why it explains the shape of the curve. So this is, um, this is um, uh, Sweden. I've been very interested in doing this for every other drug, and I did it for one drug, but... You know, uh, it's got some imperfections, but this is the ALK drug. So this is another genome class of drugs that the people call this game changer. I mean, this is the rhetoric that's used. This is roughly what I believe it w it looks like that uh, these these people with this type of lung cancer, they already lived better than average lung cancer patients. And the advent of these drugs did improve outcomes, but the gap is still massive gap, massive gap in years of life lost. And the reason I think this is important is that even drugs that people think are really good are not as, I mean, if you were the patient, this is still a devastating diagnosis, you know? It's still a diagnosis where most of your life is lost. And it's a diagnosis that, you know, you're going to be, I think, just extremely, um, gr you'll be in grief about. And and so I think it's wrong to call a drug a game changer if this is the, the best we can do. And I think that's not, that's not, that's not great. Um, that's a very, I think this is not great. That's the end of the story. And the average drug, of course, this is every single drug approved, 71 consecutive drugs um, in solid tumors. The average drug is 2.1 month survival benefit. So these drugs tend to be very, very marginal. Um, okay. So, I mean, if you found this interesting, I guess I make a podcast, which is talk about these kinds of things at length. And the book, I think, is a much more in-depth view. But um, but that's basically what I'm interested in and what we, I mean, what I do probably 50% of my time on is just thinking about, um, I don't know, if you really think about meta research, a lot of it, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know about how you all feel. In my line of work, I feel like some of these things are obvious to me. I've looked at a few of these drugs and I realized that this is not as good as people think it is. I'm shocked that their rhetoric is so inflated. And then I think, you know, the only way to prove it to them is to do what, you know, I've learned from a lot of people who are on this call, um, you know, you just do a broad overview of everything in that space and you just show that, you know, it's not terrific and you can't really argue with that. Um, and so I guess, so we have like a lot of projects on quality of life and on surrogates and on drug approval and cost and how many people get radiation and surgery and those sorts of things. So thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to season two of Plenary Session. I've been your host, Dr. Vinay Prasad. Plenary Session was produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. Review this podcast at the iTunes Store. Supporters of this podcast can back us on Patreon. Patreon allows you to support artists you like, and Patreon backers will get access to all of the slides discussed on Plenary Session. Got questions for the show? Tweet to us at plenary underscore session or email us at plenary session podcast at gmail.com. We love fielding listener questions. Thanks for listening.